author in absentia. However, time crunches and writing this means that he didn't, uh, well, really proof the final draft. So any of the good stuff in there he's responsible for, any of the mess, well, that's me. Um, and um, OK, so th this is a long project. In the long, it's going to take a while. It's already taken a while. It may not be the next book, uh, although it will actually, it will definitely happen anyway. Um, and perhaps I'll start off a little provocatively, kind of like the paper does. Um, this is, ah, all right, uh, Albert Einstein. It says, uh, as far as the laws of mathematics refer to reality, they are uncertain. And as far as they are certain, they do refer to reality. Um, for this and other reasons, I argue that Einstein was actually a hell of a critical theorist in his day. Um, and he's not the only mathematician. Like many other mathematicians, Einstein saw math as a world of fantasy, creation, signification, and representation, not one of testable hypotheses and certain knowledge. That's actually the cornerstone of this project, to start thinking creatively about quantitative computational science. Uh, that is to think about it more like Einstein than contemporary positivist. Uh, but I think I get ahead of myself just a little bit. Um, discussing, let's talk about the problem in IR. Uh, so discussions of different ways of doing social science research tend to happen at the level of epistemology or at the level of method. Uh, rarely do these discussions look at the relationship among epistemology, method, methodology. And when they do, they tend to start at the more abstract level of epistemology and then discuss the different methods that fit in. So this, we argue, leads to the frequent pairing of the post-positivist epistemology with qualitative methods and positivist epistemology with quantitative methods. We argue that those pairings are in error. Uh, we think it's an incomplete representation, particularly of what quantitative tools, uh, in scare quotes, of course, statistics, mathematics, modeling, uh, computation, have to offer IR. Particularly, we're interested in the values of these traditional quantitative tools for epistemological and ontological approaches the focus on constructivism and or critical theorizing. We, of course, aren't the first to critique the quantitative qualitative divide in IR specifically or in the social sciences more generally. Uh, still, many others who have critiqued the quantitative qualitative divide continue to reify the association of quantitative and positivist and qualitative with post positivist. For example, Henry Brady and David Collier's Rethinking Social Inquiry in critiquing the use of, quote, the quantitative template for qualitative research, seem to equate quantitative with statistical, 
arguing that quantitative measurement is ultimately based on qualitative comparisons. Uh, just a little note, statistics and mathematics are actually different disciplines. Um, for that and many other reasons, we contend that there's significantly more to it. And we think that the person who's kind of come closest to getting it in the literature is Patrick Jackson. Um, he points out that King, Cohen, and Verba's observation, uh, so this is kind of like the positivist qualitative methods textbook in, in the US, right? Uh, and in this textbook, it says, all good research can be understood, and indeed is best understood, to derive from the same underlying logic of inference. So Patrick kind of reads that, and he agrees to the extent that quantitative or qualitative neo-positivist research often derives from the same logic. That is, it's not actually the method, but the epistemology. So along those lines, we're interested in arguing that quantitative or qualitative critical research also derives from a similar logic, seeing the logic of critical research as social, complex, deconstructive, argumentative, uncertain, interpretive, and or counter-hegemonic. We propose that this is not, a, this is not only compatible, but compatibly, but usefully paired with the logic of many quantitative, formal, and computational tools in IR. So before I make that argument, a brief discussion of the terms might be a good idea. Ah, OK, to bounce. Um, as you'll notice in both the paper and the talk, uh, we don't have the right word yet to encompass the methods that we'd like to talk about. We use the right quantitative methods to refer to statistical, mathematical, computational, and formal methods, which mimics both much of the field, but is absolutely incorrect. Um, so we're working on titles. Uh, any ideas are always welcome. Um, our first argument is that these methods have very little in common except for the loose idea of measurement and many of their common uses in the discipline. We argue that most, if not all, of these methods have more potential for critical and constructivist research in IR than traditionally understood. If we don't really know the subject, that is, the methods, we also don't really know the object, which I also got to bounce, yay, um, of constructivist and critical IR. The contributors to this volume fall in very divergent places across that spectrum, as do Sammy and I as co-authors. That is, he identifies as a kind of mainstream, thin constructivist. And I identify as a post-structuralist theorist, and this has been a fun conversation. Um, there are some who argue that constructivism and critical theory are fundamentally different and possibly at odds. Uh, for the purpose of thinking about quantitative methods for critical theory, though, the commonalities between these approaches are worth exploring, if briefly. In the paper, we use Richard Price and Christian Wright Smith's argument that there's a substantive commonality between constructivism and critical theory and their ability to, quote, question positivism, reject the hegemony of a single scientific method, use interpretive strategies, engage in social construction, emancipation, exposure of structures of domination, and theory with a political purpose and awareness. In this view, constructivism and critical theory have epistemological and possibly political commonalities that would be very useful in examining the applicability to, quality, to quantitative methods with a broad brush right to these approaches. Unfortunately, there are lots of people who think constructivism and critical theory have something in common. We are not one of them, or two of them, as it is. Um, and we, in fact, make the argument that constructivism and critical theory have nothing essentially in common except the under-exploration and under-utilization of quantitative, formal, and computational methods. So as a result, we kind of have a subject and object problem with the study. Uh, again, subject, suggestions welcome. Uh, that said, we kind of look to explore and utilize those methods in both areas. And this project is a theory chapter and an article, but it's also an edited volume. Um, so our contributors are very diverse, kind of in addition to our diversity. Um, so we think it's important to talk about the relationship between methods 
methodology and theory in terms of constructing what the chapters may actually end up having in common. So some of this will probably need defending in the question and answer session. But here's a first shot at our understanding <coughs> of the relationship. Uh, like Brian Schmidt argues, disciplinary histories and debates are political and performative discourses. Research paradigms are social constructions for the organization of the field, its theories, and its scholarly hierarchies. Research paradigms, then, are politics. They are politics of performative discourse, politics of classification, politics of prestige, and politics of hierarchy. The explicit rejection of research paradigms is as much of politics as having a research paradigm is. And the adoption of purportedly apolitical scientific research paradigms, like neoliberal institutionalism, or politically agnostic uh, research paradigms, like Sammy's constructivism, and I can say that because he's not here, um, is a politics the same as adopting an explicitly political, like feminist research paradigm. The purported openness and expansiveness or closeness of one's research paradigm is a politics as well. As are, we argue, and this is probably where it's most relevant, physics envy, biology envy, and philosophy envy, um, which we argue are political investments in the field as well. I say this not only to alienate absolutely everyone in the discipline, uh, but also to suggest a parallel track of thinking about ontologies rather than paradigms for the purpose of thinking about the relationship between methods, methodology, and theory. So the politics of ontologies is a politics of the existence, function, and relationality of life, intimately tied to the politics of epistemologies, or how to know that life. Traditionally, the discipline has consciously or unconsciously treated these relationships as something like this, where your ontology determines your paradigm, which determines your epistemology, which determines your methodology, which determines your method. So you've pretty much made like all of your decisions when you choose the sort of IR research you're going to do. And so if you choose to be a neoliberal institutionalist, then you're going to be a positivist, and then you're going to do mixed methods, so you're going to run a regression and go interview some people. Um, if you choose to be a critical theorist, then you're going to be a post-positivist, and then you're going to do some good ethnographic work or discourse analysis. So the argument is it's kind of a path-dependent way of choosing our epistemology and our methodology and our methods from kind of the paradigm in which we do research. Um, and this isn't true of everybody, but we suggest that it's a broad change. trend. Instead, we suggest that methods are actually useful for multiple methodologies, and therefore multiple epistemologies, multiple paradigmatic approaches, and even multiple ontologies. So this suggestion is not so radical when we think about qualitative methodologies, like structural realist, like a good case study, almost as much as critical theorists, although they look for different things in that case study. Um, but it often seems radical when we talk about it the other way around, that is the use of quantitative methods uh, for critical theory. And that has something to do with the power dynamic in the field, which I talk about in the paper. Um, but for now, we suggest that, a, like a good case study, a regression, a mathematical model, or a computational model can be wielded across theoretical approaches, uh, across epistemologies, and even across ontologies. So we want the organization to look a little bit more like that. Um, where there are several important properties that distinguish this from traditional ways of thinking about knowledge in the field. The first is, in this understanding, ontology and method are co-constituted. Uh, so method can influence ontology in addition to ontology influencing method. Uh, there's a compatibility of not only multiple methods, but multiple method epistemology and ontology pairings. There's a possibility for multi-epistemological research. I have since published that work. We'll see how that goes in the review factory. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and most importantly for this work, there's a freedom of methods from the constraint of particular methodologies, epistemologies, and ontologies. So this, in Jill Steen's words, pushes the existing boundaries of what we claim relevant in international politics and what we assume to be legitimate ways of constructing knowledge about the world even for critical theorists who think that they're already pushing those boundaries. 
So the next section of the paper discusses the many, many risks of this position. Um, and we can talk about that more in the Q&A, because that would be much more fun than me preempting it. Um, and instead, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the several ways in which we think that these methods can make a substantive contribution to critical and constructivist IR. And so there's a little list of them. And um, we'll go through them one by one. Um, so we argue that traditional uses of the methods might be helpful to constructivist and critical ends. Uh, and then that there is a use for math as representation and construction in itself. Um, and then that mathematical methods could be used for critical policy analysis and potentially transformation. Um, so those are kind of the three major ways that we're talking about it. So the first one, the quantitative methods, Oh, not um, okay, so we argue that traditionally used quantitative methods can be useful for the field. Um, so sometimes there's quantification or a claim on quantification in constructivist and critical work, even when we don't see it or don't want to see it. Um, for example, and I'm not arguing that Cynthia Enloe finds a bias against quantitative methods, but when she asks, where are the women in global politics, she's in part making a feminist claim on quantitative methods, uh, that is, on finding and counting and understanding where women are. Many questions that constructivists and critical theorists ask could usefully draw on those methods. Um, questions involving how many or how often or under what circumstances aren't necessarily traditional positivist questions. Um, and they might usefully draw on statistical analysis. So that's the equation for a regression line. Um, if you didn't know, I just thought that was kind of cute. I thought that was cute because the first thing they teach you in graduate school data analysis is that regressions can tell you about constitution and not cause. Um, and then they promptly make you forget that and you only write about cause. And I can tell you from experience that submitting a regression to a journal with a post-positivist end to it doesn't go well. Um, <laughs> which is why this project is likely to be very popular. Um, in the book, Brooke Ackerley uses composite indices to account for con conceptual, the concept of rights enjoyment, which is a way that she wants to reframe the uh, women's human rights literature to talk about the actual impact instead of the legal framework. Um, so she wants to cross the agent structure divide without count sacrificing accountability. Suggesting that a critical theory of human rights would measure rights enjoyment of people, the existence of social, political, and economic institutions to secure them, and the progress of those institutions to provide them. She suggests that traditional data-driven projects on human rights have two problems. The first is they miss the impact side, and the second is they miss the co-constitution of the structure and the agent. So she combines the methods of traditional data, data collection with an intersubjective understanding, counting, and coding enjoyment, form what she sees as a critical empirical approach to understanding and measuring human rights, particularly women's human rights. She doesn't sacrifice the critical post-positivist monist, uh, in fact, Jackson Swords approach, that she suggests is theoretically required for a full understanding in order to collect data. She uses quantification as a piece of the puzzle to understand the critical theory and the empirical situation. So this approach is hybridized theoretically and epistemologically and capitalizes on both critique and calculation. We argue that those sorts of uses of quantitative methods when not done in a way that has the hubris of the production of objective knowledge uh, can further the exploration of critical theoretical ends. We also argue that the traditional mathematical modeling of the field, uh, that's actually a model of sanctions compliance, um, just because I felt like we should have more equations on the PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> this is actually mainly because I did something cool with one of the slides, so the other ones had their pictures too. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, so we argue that behavioral modeling can be useful in identifying the ramifications of behavioral assumptions and critical and constructivist theory when these are used to construct explanatory models. Um, I had a, actually a master's student who wrote a, an undergraduate thesis uh, adding to sanctions gains an element of ontological security and seeing if it predicted sanctions outcomes 
better than traditional models? And the answer is it predicted almost 30% more variation uh, in sanctions outcome than traditional models. Of course, the game theorists say that we did it wrong because it violates the rationality assumption. Um, we argue that it is actually a rationality assumption. Again, publishing it, it's going real well. Um, but, but, you know, maybe this, maybe this book will help. Um, in other words, gaming a critical ar argument can be an effective way of explaining what formal, to formal theorists how structural power matters. More broadly, behavioral modeling, whether based on rational choice assumptions or computational gaming, are useful mechanisms for thought experiments. That is, mathematical modeling is actually one of the only places where you can kind of play with and follow through with a thought without actually ever having to experiment on anyone, uh, which seems to be ethically useful. Um, in the book, uh, Sammy's chapter actually kind of addresses this. Um, it argues that there's a utility to formal modeling heuristically in service of constructivist theorizing. Drawing from a Weberian logic, he suggested heuristic formal models can be described and analyzed as ideal types of thought experiments rather than as description and prediction. As such, they can be used both for constructivist analysis of social and normative analysis of the possible. So using an example of a heuristic model of an international regulatory competition uh, drawn from Thibault's model of the provision of municipal services, uh, the chapter suggests that heuristic models can be both illuminating and generative of political space. In fact, he argues that he comes up with an alternate policy solution through this heuristic model. Uh, it suggests that modeling trade, interest, and rules can be done ideotypically to shed light on the credo optimal solution to regulatory competition. And that such information can be used descriptively, argumentatively, and to political ends. So this is kind of, in some sense, the argument that we feel like we're on the most firm feet with, that some of these tools could be altered very little and then imported. Uh, Therefore, it's also the one we kind of find boring. Um, so the second one is that we suggest that quantitative methods. Come oh, on, you can do it. Aha. All right, that's the reason for the picture. Um, and I'll tell you about that in a second. You can just watch it and ignore me talking. It works for me. Um, so the second way that we think about quantitative methods could be compatible with critical IR is using math to illustrate constitution and represent relationships. Uh, in the paper, I do a fair amount of babbling about math theory. Uh, if you want to hear more about it, then that's OK. For now, I'll just tell you the punchline, uh, which is that the world of math is one that is socially constructed. Uh, it lives by its own rules, if rigorously so. It invents its own representations, and it has its own formalized logics and languages. Math studies quantity. But it also actually, and much more than it studies quantity, studies structure, space, change, stochasticity, relationality, and formalization for its own sake. Statisticians and social scientists often talk about mathematics as precision, as measurement, and as a tool, as a means to an end. But mathematicians often talk about math as an aesthetic, as a creative, as an elegant and intrinsically beautiful art, ideas that aren't often expressed in positivist social science. It's that approach that I think has utility for critical IR. The sort of approach to math theory suggests that not only can mathematical tools be used for constructivist and critical ends, that's actually where theoretical math would be most at home in IR. Um, in that understanding, then, it's a spatial or equative representation of relationships, particularly as they become increasingly and even impossibly complex. We contend that critical theory wants that, and that math can do it. Math can do spatial concept maps of multidimensional, overlayered, folded, and twisted manifolds of the stuff of politics. It can represent the mess. It can suggest tweaks, trades, changes, and foldovers, alterations to the map. Imagine math like the movie The Matrix, but used to understand transparently rather than to manipulate. So in the book, my chapter does this. Uh, my chapter suggests that there are useful mathematical tools that have yet to be explored by IR researchers. I argue that disciplinary IR uses very few of the tools of mathematics available to it. 
drawing from statistics and modeling tools where it would make sense to draw from a multiplicity of tools, linear algebra, algebraic geometry. And in my chapter, I use geometric topology as an example of the mathematical method useful for critical IR for a number of reasons, including that it's hypothetical, fantastical, and imaginary in its, imaginary in its potential. So I lay out the argument that geometric topology can be used to make concept maps unlike any IR has seen before. More complex, more precise, yet less traditionally measured and constraining. I, I think it would be fun to do that and then present it to a positivist as an operationalization of a variable. That's like my pipe dream. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> in a way to expand the dimensionality, complexity, and fungibility of the IR imaginary about this concept. All right, so, so this is a Colibri Yao 16-dimensional manifold manifested uh, by its movement. That is, in its movement, you see all 16 dimensions. Um, and this is a very, very, very rough draft uh, of the model which is going to exist in my chapter. Um, it is here captured on video because I couldn't export it from the program that it was in. So this is actually a screenshot video. Uh, that's why the graphics are really, really poor. Um, but, you know, it moves and that makes me happy. Um, so, I intend to provide a simple topological map of the constitution and signification of the idea of war in IR, using different shaping and weighting techniques to depict variability, not only in the content of the concept, but in the power and distance relationships between different parts of the idea. So the argument is that different parts of the discourse have different levels of power and different distances from each other uh, that can be not measured but represented. So in my chapter, I can clearly some insights about the use of theoretical mathematics, particularly geometry, to add to critical theoretical research imaginary in IR. And if you're bored and interested, the second appendix, I think, maybe the first appendix, the end of the paper has some of the math behind this, not all of it yet, but some of it, um, kind of as an understanding of how you might make topological representations of concepts. So the third kind of approach that we think is useful, um, and these are network models, by the way, um, is the deployment of quantitative, formal, and computational methods in constructivist analysis of policymaking ideas and communication in global politics, and also then how to, in critical theory, change those. So this approach looks to understand the ways that states behave by understanding the constitution and manifestation of states' attitudes and behaviors toward each other in their discursive interaction. In other words, it uses quantitative, formal, and computational methods to understand interdependent, intersubjective constitutions of states in line with constructivist IR, and the distance between those state situations and ideal outcomes in line with emancipatory critical IR. Along those lines in the book, Matt Hoffman actually uses network analysis, mapping connections, nodes, and segmentations in order to explore the constitution and social construction of global politics. Specifically, he shows how social network analysis can be used to explore the constitutive effects of a particular institutional form, multilateral treaty making. He suggests that treaty making is more than a tool that states use instrumentally to reach their goals. It's also a practice that constitutes states as states. Treaty making is not just what states do, it is a practice that makes states. This argument can be supported by amassing qualitative data that is tracing if, how, over time, states alter their domestic structure to align with treaty making practices. We can also be explored quantitatively by exploring states' treaty making practices, especially in the emergence of treaty networks that can be spatially represented. Um, and neither of these are actually Matt's model because he was a wimp and didn't get done with him in time. Um, but imagine that his model's going to look something like that. Um, OK, so for now, kind of the punchline. Uh, part of our intended point is demonstrating the utility of quantitative methods for critical and constructivist IR for critical and constructivist IR, right, in order to broaden its horizons and enrich its analyses. 
Another part of our intended point is demonstrating the utility of quantitative methods for critical constructivist IR for quantitative methodologists. That is to broaden their view of the potential uses of traditional tools and therefore of the acceptable range of theory and research in IR. It's relatedly also for demonstrating to quantitative methodologists that their notions of science in the field are inappropriate and based on a false association of objectivity, positivism, and quantitative methods. Mostly, though, the idea is to contribute to a larger ongoing project of questioning and deconstructing the ways that IR teaches about and thinks about the relationship between methods, methodologies, epistemologies, and ontologies. Uh, so there was a parallel project to this one in psychology. And the authors uh, of that project in psychology uh, ask these questions. They say, where do questions about specific research methods come up in the picture? It should not be surprising that the concerns about methods investigation play a very important part in the schism of the discipline. We believe that, in a sense, this is just how it should be. Methods should be employed in ways that are based in considerations about the kinds of philosophical concerns at issue. Questions about epistemology, ontology, and philosophy of science. However, they shouldn't match across the schism one to one. In Patrick Jackson's words, then, the po problem is that positivist versus interpretivist, like quantitative versus qualitative, collapses all too easily into a difference of method rather than a difference of methodology, where the only way to avoid this is to clarify the terms of distinction more clearly. For this reason, Patrick suggests the terms of mind-world dualism, that is the separability of mind and world, and mind-word monism, the inseparability of mind and world. We think this is an important step to make the argument that that doesn't go far enough. Uh, particularly that both the problem that Patrick identifies, the tendency to conflate methods and methodologies, and the problem that we identify, the tendency to falsely or incompletely pair methods, methodologies, epistemologies, and ontologies, actually symptomatic of a deeper problem about how political science thinks about the ways to understand and choose methods. A problem, we argue, is manifested in the ways that we teach research methods and data analysis, in the fetishization of multi-method post-positivist studies, and in the matching of training to particular tools, rather than a broad brush understanding of the available tools. So what we'd like to see fundamentally out of this project, when we finish it, uh, is a discipline that looks differently both from ontology to method, taking a broad view of what methods might provide leverage in a particular sort of question, and from method to ontology, asking what one might learn by using particular methods and pairing it with different methodologies and epistemologies. In this sense, we look for method-driven analysis uh, in a very different way than those who use that term are looking to apply the newest tech up technique to some vulnerable new subject matter. Um, instead, we be method-driven to suggest that IR, particularly critical IR, has yet to tap the full range of methods available to serve its pre-stated and predetermined ends. It's along those lines that we suggest that scholars of IR not only rethink their understanding of methods, but also reteach themselves and their students. Not to be ambitious or anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, with that, maybe I will <laughs> shut up and put the cool shake hat on. And be happy to take questions. Now my shape is happy. <laughs> uh, questions, comments? Thank you very much. That was a very interesting and very important thing. Um, and I have just finished my PhD, which is on uh, how representations of Chechnya and Chechen have changed, and how that has legitimized new levels of violence. And I wrote my methods chapter at the very end, because the methods chapter should reflect how you have done it. And I found myself having to write <laughs> that, um, that, that I have been doing a lot of quantitative work, simply uh, counting statements, 
uh, how many statements fit into the category of this position, how many statements fit into the category of that position. And also in the sense that I have a, a certain underlying idea that the more radical your representation of the other is, the higher the level of violence is. And then you have to count, you know, how do you <laughs> how do you measure that level of violence, you know? How many more gross human rights violations, how much more um, police abuse? So you spoke directly to me, but in my in my piece this is only like one sentence in the in the methods chapter. And I but I realized that I actually could have systematized it much more. But I suppose my one kind of um, um, kind of hesitation is that first of all, uh, the type of measurement I'm doing is very rough, and somehow you know the, the, the mathematical models you have, the level of complexity in them just seems to be you know there's a big distance between that rough uh, measurement of level that I'm, I'm doing and and the complexity in mathematical models. And then, secondly, the question of capacity. Uh, I mean, I think you have two PhDs. But I, uh, for myself, I just feel like I, I use so much time just in understanding um, yeah, the, the philosophical and theoretical aspects of, of the work I'm doing that, you know, how, how does this kind of approach, wouldn't it kind of need huge research programs where you actually combine people who are working uh, on the statistical side or the, the quantitative side with mathematical models with people who are doing um, yeah, what I'm doing basically. Because at least I know my, my capacity doesn't kind of reach over um, so that's all my two kind of hesitations. Mm. Well, you know, one of the things that's interesting is you say you could have systematized it much more. But the discipline doesn't really currently provide you the tools to do that, right? Like, if you want to justify a positivist multi-method study, then here's the books you go reference to do it. If you want to justify a discourse analysis study, here's the stuff you go reference to do it. Like, no method chapter actually, like, builds its own justification. And I think that this is a place where methodologists in the discipline have really failed to provide the tools to be able to discuss it. Um, so I guess that there, there are a couple of things in, in your comments that speak to me. The first is there's a question, there's a very important question of accessibility, right? Like that is, like, I, I, I have an undergraduate math degree. I, I do this because I was almost a mathematician when I grew up. I, I you know, like, I, I fetishize this stuff. I'm into it. I don't do it in most of my research because it doesn't seem like it's the appropriate forum and <coughs> stuff like that. And also, I enjoy publishing things. And currently, this stuff is unpublishable except yay, the book contract. Um, but um, but there's certainly an accessibility issue because these methods require literally years of training to master, um, right? Like and in some sense, that's kind of easier to an American mainstream audience, even an American critical audience, because most American PhD programs require the training anyway. Um, so it's just a question of, am I ignoring class because this is going to be useless to me for my entire career? Or am I going to pay attention to the class and actually do something with it afterwards? Um, but elsewhere, that's a very, very different divide because it's learning different things. I do think that collaborative research is becoming more and more the norm in the field, so it might as well cross some of these divides. Um, and I think that that's something that might be a good place to start. Um, I also think that, like, and I, we didn't talk about this a lot in the paper, right? But I think that, like, one of the important things that we're trying to do is partly to, like, seriously tech up. Stuff, right? But it's partly to kind of say there are places where measurement, however rough, is useful to critical theorizing. And I think that maybe if critical theorists had a presentation of that measurement and a modesty about it at the same time, yeah. right? Which is to say, like, here's this measure, it sucks, but it tells you something, right? Like, then perhaps that would, at least in my fantasy of how the world works, that would get other people to do the same since most of their measures suck, but still tell you something. 
Um, and I think they, that's kind of like one of my pet peeves is I don't actually think there's enough policing of that in the peer review of quantitative work in the field. Um, and so I think maybe that's a path to both of those benefits. Um, I had a question um, about the, almost like you had this uh, in the paper as well, the relationship between ontology and ontology, paradigm, methodology, methods, right? Yeah. I'm wondering. There. Yes. <laughs> Those arrows were hard. <laughs> uh, I know you, you did say that, that you think that uh, Patrick Jackson's uh, you know, apology, uh, it's nominalism and what's the other one again? It's monism and, and dualism. So, uh, monism. Mm -hmm. uh, and you seem to fall in that category, although you think that he doesn't go far enough. But doesn't a monist position imply that you basically make epistemology uh, prior or more fundamental mm -hmm. than ontology and everything else? Um. Which, which uh, and, I, and you kind of suggested something to that effect when you said that you see method and ontology as co competitive but if method and ontology is co-constitutive, doesn't that imply that you give precisely epistemology, that is the, your point of departure, basically. I, I'm not sure, but that seems perhaps to be the implication. You know, it's actually an interesting tension in this project, right? Because like, the easy title for the project is like quantitative methods for post-positivist IR, right? And the reason that it's not there is because not all the contributors of the book consider themselves as positives. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, several of the constructivist contributors to the book would classify themselves in Patrick's understanding as dualist, um, which I think is kind of a very interesting place to be. And I like that diversity, actually, and I want to play with it instead of ignoring it, right? Yeah. Um, you know, to me, I think that the concept, like, it's not so much that the concept of monism doesn't go far enough. It's that I think uh, it would be hilarious if Patrick was in the room right now because he might kill me. I think that uh, it's that what Patrick is fundamentally studying is an effect, um, and 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 I'm not sure enough of that to. Oh look, I'm being live caught. Yes, okay. I guess I am sure enough. But I think fundamentally, I think fundamentally, what he's studying is an effect of the knowledge production cycle in IR as much as it is a philosophical position. Um, and so that's kind of why we want to put all the arrows going both ways. Although I'm not sure how good we are at that in theory play yet. Um, because I think that the, I would take the monist assumption as foundation, right? Like, and say that like all the other stuff falls in line. But I think that if you were to look over the 12 contributors to the book, they would each enter that at a different point, but agree with the schema that has the code constitutive errors. And I guess to me, like, part of what I'm currently fighting for is what do we have in common, if anything, and is it necessary to have something in common, right? But I think if anything is probably some sense of, of that co-constitution stuff. I have um, three people on this. First, uh, Francesca, then uh, Francesca. Okay. Um, thank you for your presentation. I often use... Uh, painting and, and the history of painting in my teaching in IR. And uh, in doing that, uh, there's a lot of mathematics uh, inside painting. Uh, perspectivism, uh, you name it. Now, the, the question I'm wondering is whether we should be surprised about the fact that we can get to a highly formal level of speculation about uh, the way mathematical formulas and even entering into statistics can be useful for uh, kind of plural understanding of our discipline, um, 
I am not particularly surprised. It, it might be true that there's a need for more emphasis and for more of an effort uh, to go in that direction. But then the question, maybe I'm a little self-demanding, maybe I'm too lazy. But then the question I often answer to myself is, is it worth? I mean, if I look at the, the, the history of mathematics, the point comes where we can conceive of algorithms uh, whose solution uh, would require an algorithm that uh, would end up going uh, dull in the end. So um, you, you refer to, to the risk of uh, running into boredom. I mean, in the, in, in the economics of daily doing AR and writing a paper, or a, the question sometimes is, um, is my decision to go in that direction and to be trained into the use of those methods uh, one that uh, fits uh, what I would like to say if at the end I know that that will capture, the caption I get is just uh, subject to some principle of indeterminacy, some good idea of incompleteness, and therefore I'm just to some extent uh, you know, relying on a very thin eyes. Uh, and this is my question, perhaps. Uh, I mean, this debate doesn't happen, in a, in a, doesn't take place in a void. I mean, there's a big question out there of people hired these days because of quote, uh, uh, bias, because of, uh, you know, uh, there's politics uh, out there. So if we want to take a critical approach to that, a critical theory approach, I think we should uh, also look at that. To what extent, by being brutally sincere, as critical theory should always be, is this somehow uh, uh, part of a ideological, if you like, or if you want to call it another way, it's fine, is part of a certain twist that our discipline is taking. Um, so for me, like, okay, so, so, so I'll give you the for me part, and then for me it's not. For me, I was doing this before, it was cool. <laughs> um, so if it's no surprise to you that this stuff works, it's certainly a surprise to the discipline. And one of the things that we've been doing for seven or eight years now, me and three or four other people, is submitting some of this stuff to journals. Um, and we've been doing it just for the reviews. Um, my favorite was the American Journal of Political Science reviewed an article uh, with one of these topological models. And it, and uh, we got four reviews in 48 hours, um, each of which suggested that maybe this was the next postmodern hoax, uh, which we appreciated a lot. Um, it, like, you know, we have a collection of now about 30 reviews, all of which say, like, the premise of this is ridiculous, um, which, you know, is a, might be part of the American mainstream. Um, but I, but I also think that it's not widely accepted in the discipline, and I actually think that the pushback that we got is as much like like AJPS was quantitative people responding, but like at AJIR we got plenty of critical theorists who kind of thought the same thing, right? Um, and and I think that that's kind of an important thing to know about the status of the discipline. Um, is it worth the time to invest? I think that depends highly on how easy it is to pick up uh, on your personal interest in it. Like some people, this stuff just works in their head. Some people, it takes literally years. Um, you know, I think we all have relative strengths. Um, I do think there could be a complexity payoff, but I also actually largely offered as a thought experiment to say that we're doing all the methods wrong, including this one, right? Um, there is the problem, and we do mention this in the paper, of the potential political harm of this endorsement, right? Because it is, as I mentioned briefly, this is not a power equal field in which quantitative methods and qualitative methods are valued equally especially in the United States, increasingly in the UK, um, and lots of different places around the world, actually, where there's actually a hegemonic dominance of the use of statistical methods, um, and recently kind of an equality of formal methods with that, although that, I think that is very recent, actually. Um, and qualitative methods are seen as the thing that you use when you don't have enough data to do the quantitative methods. Right. Um, so 
given that power inequality and the risk, like, so for example, in feminist IR, there's a couple of people who try to quantify the relationship between gender and peace. They do it. It's bad. Like, a lot of the published work, some of the unpublished work so far is, is pretty decent, but a lot of the published work is actually very bad quantitative work. Um, that is, like, the Sex and World Peace book uh, has an eight variable regression with an N of 106, which you learn in first year grad school is a degrees of freedom problem, <laughs> among other things. Uh, they also coded every single one of their own variables without ever using anyone else's data. Very sweet and wonderful, and then they found the relationship that they were looking for and measured that. Um, and then it got published without a lot of scrutiny about the quantitative methods because, look, they can quantify gender, right? And to me, that's the biggest concern about this stuff to me is the politics of saying, look, math can do everything, right? Um, and, and I'm not. I think that the assertion is worth it for a couple of reasons. The first is it's not going to catch on. People aren't going to, like, in mass drive math into critical theory, right? Um, for a lot of reasons, the accessibility reason being one of them. Um, and the second is that if there's a part of it that catches on, then it's going to be the argument about the directionality of understanding methods, which I think might be politically worth the risk of fetishizing quantitative ability. Mm. Okay. Well, my comment was very much, pretty much down that line. I see, so the way I was reading the project is, I, I think you're making two very important points. Um, it, it's a great project, and I think it's, it's a needed, needed questions that you're asking. One, um, I would say, is kind of sort of the negative part, the one sort of about um, this discipline inside the R methods, and sort of like, you know, if you're a post-colonial, you do these methods, you know, right? Um, and then the second one, which I think it's a bit more positive, and I think it's, it's something that uh, opens questions um, sort of for how to do research, is that the fact that the research question should actually guide um, the method, or sort of what you're interested in should guide the method. But at the same time, I'm also a bit skeptical, and I think it might be sort of the European training that we get. It's like, I think you're fetishizing the method, and I think you're not uh, the quantitative methods to an extent. And I think you could potentially be a bit more upfront uh, in the beginning, that there's certain questions that, you know, like you mentioned it, but it's kind of buried in the text, so that certain questions just are not appropriate for quantitative things. You know, like, I'm not saying, like, gender as an area is appropriate for all these methods, right? But if you're interested in a specific question, that's just not appropriate. And I think you're going to have a pushback from, especially from within the critical, sort of hardcore critical, not the yeah, and part of me thinks that I know it's going to like this, which will make it a lot of fun. Um, so I think that they're two separate questions. Am I fetishizing math? Absolutely. Uh, intentionally. Um, I'm attracted to it. I desire it in that fetishization <laughs> sense as well. Um, I, I think it's hot. Uh, I think it's interesting. Um, and, and I say that because I don't think we talk enough about our personal relationship to methods and methodology. That is, I think that like if you were having this conversation with Sammy, he would say that he's interested in the theory but doesn't do the math because he feels smarter writing than he does doing the math. <laughs> right? Like, and, and I think that's not illegitimate and totally true for lots of people, right? Like, and, and I think that a lot of times we choose not only our methods, but our position in the field, in part based on personal comfort with it, which I think is something that's really important to say. So like, is this a, is this a personal project of my like, uh, emotional and or psychosexual interest in math? Absolutely. <laughs> um, the question of, is it problematic? Uh, it is, 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 I think, a separate question, and it's important to me that it's a separate question. Um, and this is a question that we're kind of having a fight over, too. Um, that is, the text in the paper that is written about certain questions just not having appropriate uses of math uh, is Sammy's text, not mine. I actually disagree. Um, 
which will probably not make it into the final draft of the because somebody should buy it and if I put that in there, no one will. Um, I disagree because I think it's actually a question of degrees of utility and the political purpose by which you do this stuff. Um, because if you think of math the way I do as a representational tool, um, then that makes it virtually unlimited in its capacity, although perhaps not in its selection as a best method, right? Like, that said, nowhere in here do we suggest that anything is a best method for anything, right? Uh, that is, it's only kind of a question of potential compatibility and contribution, which I think is actually the level at which it will ultimately depend on. Um, I'm just I work very um, I really like reading this, and I really love this as a project. And, and so I, I want to give some of, of my reactions on the not very well structured. Um, but so I did my undergraduate training in Norway and my graduate training in the US, and I was shocked and surprised by the <laughs> level of, of aggression in the most of the debates in the US, um, and also. You know, having gone through eight years of grad school in the US, I've never heard the word ontology, ontology or half a single class in theory. So I do think that when you start out, you start out quite provocative in the whole of this. And in some way, way I think putting up people on both sides is strong. Because I do know a lot of people who do quantum work who don't consider themselves positive. Um, although I must say, uh, considering kind of you to clearly get to have met a bunch who do. Uh, identify out it. Uh, like I did, I was at Berkeley, so maybe we were weird to quite a bunch. I don't know. Um, but so to some extent, I feel if you made this less belligerent and more <laughs> pedagogical in a sense, of, of, say I haven't done any training or I've never heard the word ontological, uh, it's useful to have someone explain through and really go through the relationship to more than we do at all. But explaining really what is an ontology and what is a methodology and really how do they, they relate to each other? Because I never read texts that explain that to me in any sense of the way. I've had I've read philosophy texts that explain one side, I've read methods texts that explain the other, but I have never seen anyone draw those out really well. And and so that actually leads to my second point, which is you place this very in IR. But I'm training comparative politics, and it's exactly the same thing. So if you're going to respond to, to grading Collier and, and people in Verba, you can only make this about political science in general, even social science in general. I don't think necessarily this is about IR. So, so you know, your, your project is already ambitious, but why not make it even more ambitious? <laughs> <laughs> um, and finally, I, maybe, maybe I read you wrong, but the way I read this, you're selling quant methods to the critical theory people. But you could also think about the other way, that you could sell critical theory to the quant people, the people who have done and spent the six years getting training um, to do network analysis and, or mathematical modeling or statistical stuff. You can, you can you know, sell that they should also be considering uh, using critical theory in a lot of stuff that, that you know, in a way positivist thinking is not complex enough for the cool quantitative tools they have acquired. So a more complex theory would make their work much more interesting. So suddenly it's sort of set on way. There's lots of messy thoughts there. So thank you. You know, it's interesting because I was about to ask you where you found the quantitative people who don't consider themselves positivist, and you answered comparative politics, right? Well, um, yeah. Because, like, it, we, what we, we took the trip data from the last 15 years of IR journal articles and only found four articles that were coded quantitative but not positivist. Okay. Um, and most of those were descriptive statistics. Um, but the trip data is only IR. Yeah. Um, so it may be that it's actually more kind of a larger group of people in kind of uh, comparative politics, maybe. Um, you know, it's interesting that you characterize this as weird, because to be honest, this is like the most toned down version of it I've ever written. Um, which is, of course, nowhere near the publishable version, certainly. Um, we are struggling with the level thing, right? Because part of us wants to write this as a book that, like, the 12 of us can read, and that's cool. Right, um, and part of this, like Michigan, kind of wants it to be a textbook, um, and 
I'm not sure. They've given us 300,000 words, so maybe in that we can figure out how to do both. Um, but, I'm, but I'm worried that, like, I'm worried about the pitch of the level, right? Like, that is the neglect of the depth of the relationship in this in this draft is actually, like, we're still working it out. But, like, this is a 15,000-word paper. Like, which is which is not like going to end up being the in theory the theory chapter is going to be shorter than that right you know, or something like that so we're kind of still working on how that works um, so the comparativists in my department have convinced me that there are no critical theorists in comparative politics um, they may or may not be right about that <laughs> but like like to me the the reason that it's pitched at IR is because there's kind of this specific debate that I want to enter. Mm -hmm. But you're right that it would probably be more useful to talk about it more broadly, not least because of this parallel project we've actually figured out in psychology, right? Um, which is, there's some stuff that isn't applicable to what we do, but the great majority of this project like we we found really useful. Um, you know, and it's interesting because we have pitched it in the selling quantitative methods to critical theorists part, although. Several of the contributors of the book are actually quantitative positivists that were like, you know, tugging at to get to kind of uh, do something a little bit more creative. Um, although several of the contributors to the book are uh, kind of the other way around, where we're pushing critical theorists to kind of do the math um, in some sense. Um, you know, but to me, I think there's a political risk too in selling critical theory to quantitative people, because at least for me, like, I had a couple of experiences where I've been in the room with, actually, here's a good example that I can actually use. Um, there's a group of kind of women in the discipline that have started getting together and thinking about issues of gender citation practices and gender promotion practices and things like that. Um, and, and most of them are kind of mainstream positivist Americans. Um, and uh, they invited me, and I couldn't figure out why for a while. Uh, and then I figured out I'm the person who explains why. But I also figured out that I need to be really careful in the words that I use, because like the depth that it took me to get to that explanation is never going to be picked up. Mm -hmm. right? The, the, the sound bite part, and I don't mean that they're not taking it seriously. I mean that they're not going to go do that reading, because political economy of time. Right? Mm -hmm. like, so, like, if I don't explain it right the first time, it's going to be reproduced wrong, right? Like, that sort of thing. And so, like, I worry both about, like, if you sell it to quantitative methodologists, then maybe, number one, you get an overrun of critical theory with math, which is exactly what I don't want, right? Or number two, you kind of get the short version of critical theory. On the other hand, like, you know, I guess that my ultimate point is that we should all actually be literate in books, right? Which is a, but like I think how you get from here to there matters. Uh -huh. It has to come. <laughs> because you have all the It's not in the paper. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's, it's, uh... Outside the bounds. Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> uh, because there's, there's something here about, uh, it's, you know, related to what others have said, I think to a degree as well, which is that um, it's not entirely clear uh, what critical theory is here. I think you could do uh, a bit of a better job spelling that out. Because you have a discussion of, you know, Duval and the Smith and others and different conceptions of what constructivism is in the theory. Um, so that's one aspect of it. That uh, what is, you know, good proper theory and what is critical about it. Which can be many different things than what we normally associated with constructivism and critical theory, basically. That's one thing. The other is the, the place of theory in the constitution or the, the complex, you know, logic set up between ontology, methodology, methodology, paradigm, and methodology. Because the, the, the research question 
because you you say, if I remember correctly, that we should focus more on what type of stuff can these methods do, depending on your specific research question. Mm -hmm. And that is, I guess, where some substantive theory about something comes in. So if you can say something about that, I would be very happy. So this is part of the we know neither the subject nor the object of the project problem. Um, and, and honestly, I think that the word theory is in the project as a crutch. Um, that is, like, it recurs kind of quantitative methods for constructivist critical IR theory, right? Like, I think it's actually in there because the answer isn't epistemology and it's not ontology, so, like, it's got to be some middle of word like theory, right? Like, in some sense. Like, which doesn't do the word theory any particular justice, right? And ultimately, like, if that's the case, it will need to be lifted from the text. Um, the other way to do it is to figure out what we mean by it and the place that we're using it, um, which I think would probably be more productive. Um, you know, I, I like, like, when I think about, but my problem is that this is another infinite regress problem for me, is to me, theory is practice. Right, like, and therefore is everything and nothing at the same time. Um, and I think they, that definition has zero utility for this project, um, like in terms of how the word theory is being used. So then there's theory as like knowledge building and theory as critique, right? Cox is kind of. Uh, I don't know, the dichotomy of how you think about theory that maybe is more useful for this particular project because we mean the theory as critique part, right? Um, at the same time, what I don't like about that is, like, as many times as Cox and all the people who repeat that have tried to not make it that way, that's essentially a negative distinction. Right, like that's theory as critique responding to theory as theory building, not theory building as critique. And I think to me, the theory building as critique part is the part that this actually would be the most useful for. Um, so, so the lo the short answer to your question is I have no idea, um, and and the long answer is that I think that. Answering that question will actually clear up the subject object question of this thing. Because I think you lost the response of the, the theory building aspect will allow you to take these methods that you suggest one should use and discuss in some detail to build new, better theories that take you way beyond existing so-called constructive or, or critical theory in IR and, and elsewhere as well. So the, the discussion that we have uh, towards the end of the Deleuze um, and Gratari, mm -hmm. yeah. because the, the, the moving thing, mm -hmm. that's a spatial mapping of this course, no? Yes. Yeah. So that type of, of stuff, uh -huh. I, I would do, you know, that's a big, uh, Selling point for, for people like me that do try to do this course analysis that don't have a very good idea of what it is. Um, it helps fundamentally because if you do that, then it's easier to specify where is the critical potential here. What what is what is it? To say something about the level of causal mechanism or what have you. Or Others? Uh, uh, do you want to say something more? We can talk about risers if you really want to. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we can continue. Yeah, okay. I'll throw in a really stupid question. Maybe it's very difficult. I don't know. Or, or, yeah. How would you define theory? <laughs> oh, I think I just said I don't know. Um, that is that I think that my definition of theory isn't particularly useful for this project. So my definition of theory is Marisha Zalowski's uh, definition, um, which is 
theory as practice, as the everyday, as action and reaction, right? That, ev that everything we do is theorizing, um, which I think is entirely not applicable to or useful for the purposes of the bounds of this project. Um, so I think that like the theory, do, like the best I can come up with is this theory as problem solving versus theory as critique thing, except maybe theory building as critique. But that's the best I've got, which is why the word theory is used entirely unreflectively throughout the text of this particular draft of the paper. More reflection useful. <laughs> Okay. On, uh, on that note, uh, thank you so much, Laura. This has been fantastic, and uh, I'm sure we will continue to uh, discuss this uh, here at the end. So, thank you so much. Well, thank you. So yes, kind of, but no kind of. Like, this, this equation is one dimension. <laughs> It could be how it's written is not. Which is like, you know, like that particular representation of it is just